All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Sure appreciate everybody coming out for this. Uh, I'll have to admit this is a pretty uh, interesting experience. I'm a little bit technically challenged, uh, even though I have a web-based business and everything. I have some uh, trusty people that surround me that help me with a lot of this, but I uh, obviously am well aware of Google and, and use it quite extensively. And, and uh, a couple years ago, my cousin, who's with me today and handles all of my website stuff, he says, there's this new thing that's you know starting to catch on that we really need to start riding the wave. He's like, it's called YouTube. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, and he explains it all to me. He's like, we need to start doing little technical videos and putting on YouTube. We can reach a bunch of people. And, and at the time, I forget how long ago it was, but it was pretty pretty obscure and a lot of people didn't know about it. And uh, I'll have to say it was one of the, the better moves we made because uh, one of the things that uh, when you start getting working with alternative technologies and things, the internet really has made a lot of stuff possible that 20, 30 years ago uh, was stuck in people's garages and nobody could really network and figure this stuff out. So, you know, whether I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, of the impact that your work here has, but uh, I've seen it personally in the alternative fuels world where the internet and, and uh, things like Google and YouTube really have uh, created a path. So, you know, you're really involved in a lot of cutting edge stuff and uh, hats off to you. So I uh, wanted to talk a little bit uh, about truth about biofuels in America. And the reason I use that title is because there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of propaganda and fluff out there. And, and what I want to do today is possibly uh, shed some light on some of the, the uh, the fluff and, and some of the misinformation and kind of cut, cut to the chase on, on uh, what some of these technologies and, and options really are and uh, have a discussion about some of the viable options that are out there and some of the options that are being presented as viable and, uh, you know, really looking, taking a hard look at them. To give you a little bit of background about uh, who I am and, and why, I, why I'm uh, supposedly qualified to talk on this, I grew up in a little uh, small town in, in Alaska and I uh, had one grandfather who was a rancher, the other grandfather was a commercial fish, fisherman and my father was a, a land surveyor and a bush pilot. And so growing up in this, uh, this small town and, and in the wilds of Alaska and everything, you kind of by nature, you kind of learn to be self-reliant and to realize that you can't always go down to the corner drugstore and buy what you need. If you're on the fishing boat and something breaks, you either have to do without or you have to fabricate something that'll work or fix what broke. And, and the same with uh, you know being on a ranch in Alaska and everything and, and surveying out in the bush. And, and so I grew up with people around me that really taught me how to think outside the box and the necessity of, of being able to do for yourself. And, and uh, unfortunately, when it comes to alternative fuels and alternative energy and, and things like that, because of a lot of misinformation out there, uh, we really have to take the responsibility of finding what, what these technologies are, really getting to the bottom of, of them by ourselves, because unfortunately, we can't believe everything we read on the internet. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. But with a little bit of, of knowledge and the right questions, each one of you can figure out what's going to work for you and what's going to uh, complement your lifestyle and allow you, even if it's in a small way, to, to somehow lessen your dependence on, on fossil fuels. Uh, right around uh, 1999, I decided to move from Alaska and uh, move my family down to southern Missouri. We uh, bought a farm down there and, and wanted to start... Uh, getting back a little bit close to family. A lot of my family had moved out of Alaska. And I heard this reference, uh, somebody was talking about how you can make diesel fuel out of vegetable oil. And when I first heard this, I thought, well, that's, a, that's a really brilliant concept, you know? It, it's, uh, it's a renewable resource and it's not something we're pumping out of the ground, but I never did get very much information on it right at the time and it just kind of stuck in the back of my mind. And later I, I uh, started reading and, and finding out a little bit more about biodiesel and uh, this process of taking 
new vegetable oil or waste vegetable oil and creating it into diesel. Well, growing up in Alaska on the fishing boats, uh, everything's diesel and my, my grandfather was really into fuel efficient cars and so grandma was always driving a diesel Mercedes and he had a diesel VW and, and so I kind of grew up with this culture of, of fuel efficiency and, and conservation and everything and so when I heard about this concept of taking a waste product and making it into fuel, it really intrigued me. And I did some research on the subject and, and uh, found out about biodiesel a little bit and, and, and uh, got all my chemicals together and I was going to play chemist and, and brew up a, a pot of this biodiesel and realized that I really didn't know what I was doing and so I set it back on the shelf and, and uh, I got to reading a little bit more about the concept of straight vegetable oil. And, and when you're looking at using vegetable oil in a modern diesel engine, the main thing that you have to overcome is viscosity or how thick it is. And so instead of using chemicals to go overcome that viscosity, you can also do it by using heat. Everybody's fried something on the stove. You, you, put, it, you put the oil on the stove, heat it up, it gets real liquid and runny. And uh, so I started to venture down that road and, and uh, built this crude little contraption that I put on my old Toyota diesel truck and, and uh, went down to the local Chinese restaurant and, and got some, some oil and filtered out the chicken strips and small mammals and whatever else was swimming around in there and, and poured it into my truck and flipped the switch and was waiting for it to blow up and it just kept running. And so that was kind of the start. Uh, at, at the beginning, there was no, and, and we refer to this as SVO or straight vegetable oil versus biodiesel. There really was no SVO industry. Uh, there was one or two people that were dabbling with, on, with it and you could get on the internet and find some people that were kind of talking about it, but you know, very few people had actually done it. And, and by going through this experience and all the trial and error, I realized that maybe some of my experience would be valuable to others that wanted to break out of the, petroleum, the clutches of petroleum. And so I decided to put together a little do-it-yourself kit and put it on the internet and see what happens. And so during the early years, I referred to it as our Model T kits. You know, it was, it was, we were just taking off-the-shelf components and forcing them into, into uh, into service and, and uh, I was working out of my garage and, and we uh, you know had, uh, had some early success and everything and, and really started to uh, get into this and realize that there was a lot of people out there that realized that, that petroleum wasn't working too hot for us and they wanted to do something else. And uh, so in the early days we, uh, we did a lot of uh, trial and error and uh, like the saying goes, uh, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from poor judgment. And so there was uh, a lot of trial and error, but it worked and we, we uh, kept growing and, and uh, now we've, we've uh, come up with some technology that uh, is been developed specifically for the SVO industry and as we, we gain more experience, instead of taking off the shelf components, we can, we can actually uh, design stuff that works specifically for our application. We'll get more into the details of straight vegetable oil uh, a little bit later and uh, I'm going to go through and, and just highlight some of the alternative fuels and alternative transportations uh, that are, are talked about today and we'll go through and just highlight a few of those and then what I'd like to do is open it up to questions and, and uh, just have the rest of the discussion be question driven. Hydrogen fuel cells. Interestingly enough, we don't hear a whole lot about that uh, anymore like we did three or four years ago. Three or four years ago, State of the Union address and everything, that's all we heard about was hydrogen fuel cells. And, uh, this is uh, a great little piece of, and, and you got to remember that uh, I'm by nature a conspiracy theorist and, and believe everybody's out to get us and all that stuff. So, so uh, you know, free legal advice is worth what you pay for it. But th I'll go ahead and, and uh, uh, give you the version according to Anderson of what I think's going on. And, and like I said, I've been in the, in the alternative fuels industry and seen a lot of the uh, the stuff that goes on, I've gotten a few threatening phone calls from a few different parties that, you know, I better join the club and get the secret decoder pin and let them help me, otherwise I might, you know, end up in jail or worse. And, you know, some of that stuff does go on, but generally they're doing that because they really don't have a leg to stand on. Anyway, hydrogen fuel cells. 
A lot of people got excited about hydrogen because they think, well, you know, you take, there's hydrogen and water and you, you use electrolysis and, and separate the hydrogen and the oxygen and, and you got nothing but clean exhaust coming out and, and uh, that's wonderful. Let's all get behind hydrogen fuel cells. And uh, the reality is that the hydrogen fuel cells, you can extract hydrogen from water. But when you do that, it's more of a, a power storage medium because the only way that you can get the hydrogen out is if you put electricity in. And unfortunately, it's not really an efficient process. And the dirty little secret is, is that, that when they're given the State of the Union address and talking about, you know, on the news about new hydrogen fuel cell technology, they weren't talking about electrolysis. They were talking about extracting the hydrogen from propane or natural gas. And so here we have something that still relies on fossil fuels. Now granted the exhaust was cleaner, but when you looked at the cost of the technology and that we're still tied to fossil fuels, it wasn't really as sexy as they were making it out to be. It really wasn't the answer uh, thinking, well, we got a whole ocean full of water, there's all the fuel we need. And uh, so that's kind of an example of, of a technology that the powers that be really got behind and were promoting. And the reality was that it, was, it, it really isn't viable at this stage. Now, does that mean we stop uh, researching hydrogen? Heavens no, because there's so many different uh, things that are discovered every day and there might be something discovered next week that might make it a, a viable solution. But at the stage that it's at now and the way that the, they were really planning on doing it, in my mind, it really didn't make a lot of sense because we're still kind of business as usual. I've got a theory, and that is, is that if, uh, if high-level government officials are promoting a certain alternative fuel, run. Because what it is, is it's not really a viable solution, and that's why they're behind it. They get behind stuff that they know really won't affect their long-term uh, goals of selling uh, petroleum. And I know that sounds cynical, but uh, if we had several hours, I could tell you quite a few stories that really uh, bring that home. But, but unfortunately, that's pretty much what's uh, going on. If it's, if it's a solution that they're promoting and saying, hey, this is the latest and greatest, it means that there's some really uh, big problems with long-term uh, viability, and that's why they're promoting it, is because they can get behind it, and it looks like they're really you know, promoting something that's great, and they run it on CNN, you know, for a week, and everybody gets excited and goes out and votes for the guy that's talking the most about, you know, some new technology, and the reality is nothing really happens. So that's hydrogen. Let's move on. Hybrid electric vehicles. Interesting story. When we uh, flew into California uh, last week, uh, flew into San Jose, uh, as everybody's probably heard, the actress Daryl Hannah is really, and Willie Nelson, they're all into biodiesel and biofuels. And we uh, recently did a, did a conversion for Daryl Hannah and uh, had to go do some tweaking on her car down, down in Malibu. And so we had to rent a car and, and we get in and I had, I had uh, reserved a, you know, a small compact and everything because I knew we had a ways to go. And, and rumor has it gasoline's a little bit high here in California. And, and so we get there and immediately they, they said, you know, well, you're going to be paying 114 bucks for this five days, but for $130, we can get you in an SUV. That was their, their sales pitch and everything. And I, I said, you know, I said, that's great and all. I said, but we got a ways to drive. And I said, I think I'd rather have the smaller car so we can get better fuel economy. And the guy's like, oh, well, you want fuel economy? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, for that same $130 for the five days, you can have this uh, Toyota hybrid. I said, okay, well, you know, that sounds cool. We'll take it. But it's interesting that people's first thought is, let's get into the SUV, let's get into the SUV. And uh, so anyway, we got uh, uh, Toyota hybrid, and uh, we've been able to put almost 1,000 miles on it. So it's been uh, really interesting to get to use that and to, to really see what it can do. Uh, I have test driven hybrids in the past and, and uh, you know, in certain situations they really shine, in certain situations uh, they're a little bit overhyped, but, you know, going down to Malibu and back and right, driving the Pacific Coast Highway and, and uh, not really paying attention to, to uh, babying it too much, and we've averaged 46.5 miles per gallon, which compared to the other vehicle that we would have, you know, even the smaller car would have gotten maybe 25, 30 if we were lucky. So, uh, 
it really uh, wasn't that bad of a deal. And you know, as we t you know, the hydrogen fuel cells isn't really anything that your average uh, Joe can get their hands on. But obviously, hybrid cars and, and uh, up and coming some electric vehicles are something that uh, are some options. And here on out, we'll talk about some options that that uh, actually are within our grasp, and and we need to analyze and see is this going to fit my lifestyle. And this is something that I really want to stress to everybody: is that do your homework. Uh, you know, if it takes, if you think that a hybrid is going to fit your lifestyle and the way that you drive and commute and everything, I'd encourage you to go out and rent one for a week. You know, they're only about 130 bucks for the week and just really drive around and see uh, what kind of fuel economy you're going to get. I mean, in certain situations, they really shine. Certain situations, they're not so great. But, you know, any technology that you're looking at and, and uh, any way that you're looking to to lessen your dependence on foreign oil, really spend some time and do your homework and don't just jump into it. There is a lot of information on the internet, there's a lot of misinformation, but there are people out there and, and generally if you put enough time in you can sift through the misinformation and the information and get some good hard data on the, on the technology that you're looking at. Uh, you know, like I said, uh, we've spent the last few dry days driving a hybrid, and it definitely, uh, you know, has gotten a lot better fuel economy than, uh, a, you know, a, a car with just a regular gasoline engine. But uh, at 46 miles per gallon, uh, you've got, you know, extra money in, into the uh, initial purchase of the car. There are other uh, vehicles out there, for example, the, the Volkswagen TDI, that will get uh, 45 to 50 all the time without the hybrid drive. Uh, one of the, the things that really frustrates me is when I travel around the world and I go to these other countries, they have diesel electric hybrids. Now that's something that I can really sink my teeth into because a diesel electric hybrid about the size of a Toyota Prius uh, running on waste vegetable oil, uh, you'd pretty much eliminate uh, your use of, of uh, foreign oil and you'd be getting probably close to 90 to 100 miles per gallon. And so there's some politics on why we don't have a lot of fuel efficient diesels uh, in this country. The reality is that the technology exists for the 100 mile an hour car right now. It's there, it's accessible. Uh, the problem is that that uh, they are prohibited from importing that stuff into this country for the express reason is that they will last too long and they won't burn any fuel. Uh, one of the things that really frust, like I said, when I go overseas, I see all this marvelous technology that, uh, that they're using over there. And, and over here, we have the politicians, you know, signing some bill that's going to mandate 35 miles per gallon. And they've got cars, uh, you know, in Europe and Japan that will get a solid 80 miles per gallon right now and meet every crash test that we have but they will not let them uh, import them into this country. And so, do they meet the emissions tests? Yes, they do. They meet the emissions tests. In fact, the, the European emissions standards are more stringent than ours here, and uh, they meet the emissions uh, hands down. And especially when you look at the overall life cycle of the vehicle and how much uh, fuel it's going to be burning. And so, uh, you know, these are the things we got to look at. Where, you know, how much does it cost to produce that vehicle? Where's the energy coming? On, on electric vehicles, one of the things that a lot of people think, well, I can just plug it into the wall and I can drive and I'm not using any fossil fuels. But they don't realize that we've got a coal plant somewhere digging out coal and then you, you know, got to transport that to the power generation plant. And then uh, you look at the laws of thermodynamics and the amount of, of energy that actually makes it to that plug uh, if I remember rightly, it's somewhere around 28% of the, the coal, the energy out of that coal actually makes it into the energy in your home or into your vehicle, okay? So you've got over 70% over of the energy in a coal plant is used to just keep the whole thing up and moving. And you've got you know, power loss through high transmission lines and everything. So you've, this is one of those areas where, like I said, you really got to do the homework and figure out what's the whole life cycle of this technology. And if I buy an electric car, 
okay, where's my electricity coming from? A lot of uh, electric co-ops, you can, you can pay a little bit higher price and, and be guaranteed that, that uh, whatever electricity you use is going to be bought from a renewable resource. If you do something like that and do your homework on that, then you can sleep well at night knowing that you're not really participating in uh, dirty technology, but if you buy an electric vehicle and all your power is coming from a coal plant somewhere, and when you calculate all the uh, losses and everything, you're using, you know, you're polluting twice as much than if you would have just driven a gasoline car, you know, you might sleep well at night as long as you don't dig too deep and find out what's really going on. And so this is one of those areas where you need to realize where the electricity is coming from. All right, compressed air cars. This is fairly, uh, New. There's been some developments uh, recently in uh, in some fairly small uh, air engines that are very efficient because they're running on air. There's not there's not uh, a lot of their mechanical energy uh, is lo isn't lost in heat. But there again, we have to look at where is that compressed air coming from. You know how the laws of thermodynamics do not let you create nor destroy energy. You know, that you can't really get anything for free, and, and that energy has to be developed uh, from some source. And so we need to analyze, all right, if we're going to look at, at something like a compressed air car, that's great. It's going down the road with compressed air, but what kind of energy did we put in to, uh, to compressing that air? Because that energy to move you down the road has to come from somewhere. But this is a fairly new technology that I anticipate that we're going to uh, see quite a bit more of. Ethanol. Here's, here's, uh, here's kind of a black eye on the alternative fuels world. The reality is, is that it takes about three gallons of petroleum to produce one gallon of ethanol, and that's not even talking about the wastewater it produces. And when we talk about this, we're not talking about cellulosic ethanol, which is definitely better, but not quite there yet. But what we're doing in this country right now with corn ethanol is pretty much a disaster. It takes, uh, it takes a lot of petroleum to grow that corn, and when you look at the, the numbers, uh, it, we're spending about three gallons of petroleum to produce one gallon of ethanol, and so you don't have to be a mathematician to figure out that we're heading in the wrong direction. I'm not saying that we need to scrap it. Places like Brazil, they've uh, done a lot better with, with some sugar cane and sugar beets, but also you've got to look at the impact, the amount of uh, forest that they're clear cutting to put in those plantations. And so everything has a, a ripple effect and, and there's no one technology that has you know, all goods and no bads. You've got to look at everything and look at the life cycle of the fuel or the technology that you're looking at and realize where, uh, where it's coming from and where it's going. And uh, in this country right now with, with corn-based uh, ethanol, it's uh, pretty much politically charged and there's a lot of big lobbies out there for the, for the uh, corn industry that have gotten stuff pushed through and, and they're not hanging on to it. You know, that now that the truth is coming out, you can see that there's not a lot of support for it and it's kind of dying out. And uh, you know, ultimately, the farmer is going to be the one, again, left holding the bag. Any time that, that the government or any uh, entity will put a lot of subsidies into a, a, a uh, technology to take it public, and I'm not talking about research. I mean, obviously, there needs to be research done. But when they take it to the public and try to present it as an, a viable alternative, and the reality is that it's heavily subsidized, pretty soon, that can't go on forever, so pretty soon the carpet gets yanked out from under people and it's the people like the farmers that are left holding the bag because they've changed their whole operation. And so I've had people argue, well, you know, of course we've got to support eth ethanol because we've got to take care of the American farmer. But you can't take care of the American farmer on something that's based on a lie. And so there again, we got to cut through the emotions sometimes and really look at what's happening and, and look at history and look at some of the, the catastrophic effects of uh, some of these uh, things throughout history have, have done. Biodiesel. Uh, talked a little bit about uh, biodiesel before. And uh, the next one we have is, is straight vegetable oil, which is, is uh, what I've chosen to, to devote my life's work to. But biodiesel is uh, where you take uh, plant oils. Uh, it could be from peanuts, sunflowers, uh, rapeseed, uh, olive oil, any kind of plant oil. And it goes through a process called transesterification. 
which is uh, a really fancy word for taking some household lye and some methanol and mixing it up together and, and it goes through a chemical reaction and uh, it basically drops all the real thick stuff out of the oil and it thins the oil chemically. Uh, biodiesel is, is used uh, fairly extensively in the U.S. The thing about biodiesel is it can be mixed in any proportion with uh, regular petroleum diesel. And in low proportions, uh, it really doesn't have any effect on the cold weather uh, abilities. And so it's a fuel that can be assimilated into our current uh, distribution uh, structure without uh, too much trouble. There's a lot of, uh, you know, here we've got a commercial biodiesel plant. Here we've got, there's several uh, websites out there where you can buy some homebrew kits that are a little more professionally put together. And then you've got, uh, uh, you know, Rube Goldberg in his garage here and uh, people brewing their own. You notice the respirators on these guys. Uh, I've got a few friends that do biodiesel that are missing their eyebrows and uh, unfortunately there have been a few people that uh, through some explosions have have uh, lost their life over the last few years doing some homebrew biodiesel projects. So if done right, uh, biodiesel is an option for the, for the uh, do-it-yourselfer. Uh, but you are dealing with some fairly caustic chemicals and you do need to be careful if you start to, to uh, get into biodiesel production. Uh, from from a, a home brewer standpoint, if it's something that you decide you want to do in your garage or your backyard, uh, like I said, you're going to need methanol, you're going to need a uh, little bit of uh, lye, little regular household lye. Uh, sodium hydroxide, I think, is the uh, official name for it, but somebody can correct me on that if I'm wrong. Uh, but anyway, you, uh, it, takes, uh, it takes about 24 hours uh, to, to brew up a batch and wa wash it and everything. It's a little bit labor intensive, and uh, when you factor in your, your uh, costs, uh, some, I've heard numbers as low as 75 cents per gallon and, and as high as $2 per gallon, uh, what it's going to cost you to, to, to brew that biodiesel. But when you consider close to $4 at the pump, it can be a, a, a viable option for people. One thing about biodiesel is that you don't have to modify the vehicle uh, uh, hardly at all, especially the newer ones. And it can go just right into your tank, and you can put a tank of petroleum diesel in there right after you've had the biodiesel and vice versa. Uh, what kind of waste do you Waste uh, with biodiesel, you're looking at about uh, 20 to 25 uh, percent glycerin content, and so you, the volume. If you do a, a 100 gallon uh, batch of biodiesel, you're going to have 20 to 25 gallons of, of glycerin. Uh, you can make a lot of soap with it, or figure out how to dispose of it. Here's some shots of uh, me at my local neighborhood uh, fish fry place, gathering some waste vegetable oil. And as you can see, the stuff looks good enough to eat. Uh, we uh, Generally, I've got two restaurants that are fairly close to my house, and I live in uh, fair, fairly rural Missouri. And uh, I can get anywhere from four to 500 gallons a month. And uh, I just take a trailer over there, and I, I bulk gather it. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of our customers that live in, in uh, small you know, apartments or something, they'll uh, hook up with a, a you know, little cafe or something, just get a little five gallon jug and they'll take that home once a week. And it really depends on your usage. You can get thousands of gallons or you can get, you know, five or 10 gallons. And uh, what we do with straight vegetable oil is we use the waste vegetable oil that the restaurants uh, throw away. Most uh, places, the restaurants usually will have to pay to get rid of this oil. And so if you go in there and make friends with them and, and talk to them, uh, they're usually more than happy to uh, support your, your little alternative fuel habit because it saves them and they can give you fuel for free. And so uh, what you have invested is a little bit of time, but uh, generally speaking, uh, once you get set up, you'll spend no more time dealing with your, your straight vegetable than you would if you had to stop at the, at the uh, gas station. And so this uh, isn't for everybody. Obviously, you can see I've got a big setup there. Like I said, I, I gather probably over 1,000 gallons a month uh, for my business and for my personal use, and so that's fairly extensive. But if you think about that, 1,000 gallons at, at four bucks a gallon, you know, that's four grand a month that, that I can go out and, and literally in about an afternoon get that amount of oil. So financially, it makes a lot of sense. One of the great things about the straight vegetable oil is there's no chemical modifications. All right, we can probably stop that. <laughs> 
uh, there's no chemical modifications that have to happen to the oil. You gotta filter out, again, all the bumpy chunks and the, and the dirt. Uh, and uh, from there on, uh, it's a matter of putting it into your vehicle that uh, has a conversion system that's been put on it. What the conversion system uh, consists of, in a nutshell, is we put on a parallel auxiliary heated fuel system. And so we don't really mess with the stock uh, fuel system on there, but we put in heated tank, heated fuel lines, heated filters with a switching valve so we can go between the two fuels. We start the vehicle up on regular petroleum diesel. Once the engine's up to temperature, we flip a switch on the dash and it switches over to the uh, auxiliary fuel system which has the vegetable oil in it and you're running on 100% recycled vegetable oil. And uh, this, uh, I've got some other slides that I'm gonna probably stop in the interest of time and open it up to questions, but uh, as you can imagine, this is kind of uh, pretty obscure in the alternative fuels world. Uh, a lot of the powers that be, especially in the biodiesel world, don't really like what we're doing because they don't want people to get the word out that you don't really have to go through the transesterification process. I'm definitely not anti-biodiesel. Uh, it definitely has a place. Uh, biodiesel, the big biodiesel lobby tends to be a little bit anti-SVO because, you know, we're not playing the game by their rules. Little by little, we are gaining some footholds. I think there's about five states now that have passed exemption laws. Uh, I helped write some uh, uh, legislation that we got passed in Arkansas that uh, totally exempts waste vegetable oil in its pure form as a fuel. So it's non-taxed and uh, it's got a full exemption. So there's definitely some, uh, some inroads being made uh, legally because it's really a no man's land. Uh, depending on who you talk to, they say there's no problem with it and some people say, you can't do that. You know, they haven't given you permission. But little by little, the states are stepping up and, and uh, uh, interestingly enough, there's quite a few uh, uh, legislatures around the country in the different state legislatures that actually burn vegetable oil and uh, are, are getting a little backdoor legislation in to, to kind of open the playing field and just say, hey, look, you know, we'll leave you alone, keep doing this. Uh, that's a general overview. Is straight vegetable oil the answer? No. Is ethanol the answer? No. Is hybrid cars the answer? No. None of these technologies or, or the technology that might be thought up next week or something, none of these things are the one answer. It's gonna take a little bit of everything, I think. We don't have too many alternative fuels at this stage. There's a lot of great ideas that are hatched in people's garages uh, throughout uh, time, and a lot of them, with, because of, of lack of networking, have kind of died. Some of them have been killed, some of them have died, but it's kind of a unique time in history because with the internet and a good old Google search now and then, you can network with people that have these ideas, and, and you know, I've definitely benefited from being able to literally go around the world and uh, network with people that have some ideas, and when we start to talk, we think of ways that we can reduce our dependency on foreign oil. We know what doesn't work in this country. Going overseas for oil is not working so hot for us. And so this is something that everybody can look at and uh, realize that even though it's something small, possibly in your life that you can do something to change a little bit uh, the amount of, of petroleum that you effect, effectively use. And uh, straight vegetable oil is something that I've found that, uh, you know, there's several billion gallons of waste vegetable oil produced in the U.S. annually. Uh, it's a disposal problem for a lot of restaurants. It's something that I can do and a lot of my customers can do that can totally take them uh, out of the petroleum cycle. Does ExxonMobil feel it? Absolutely not. We're just a bunch of kooks that are running around on French fry grease. Do I feel it? Yes. You know, in the last three years, I drive a big old Ford Excursion Evil SUV that is cleaner emissions than a Toyota Hybrid, and I've saved $30,000 in fuel. The rig didn't cost me that much when I bought it three, three years ago. So for me, it's a 100% difference. For ExxonMobil, we're not even a thorn in their side. And so it's little things like this, some of these, these unique and obscure uh, ideas and technologies that little by little can make a difference. And you know, some people I've talked to, they say, well, you know, well, if everybody does this, there won't be enough oil, so I'm not doing it. Well, you know, 
that may be true, but there's, there's about 3 billion gallons out there that's thrown away in landfills every year. Let's soak that up. Let's use that. That's 3 billion gallons that we're not importing from overseas. And once that's used up, let's go for something else. And in the meantime, there's new technologies that are coming up. You know, algae oil, for example, is a really exciting thing because instead of getting, you know, 100 gallons from an acre of soybeans of oil, they're producing 50,000 gallons of algae oil on an acre every other week. You know, some of these technologies and, that can complement the biodiesel, the straight vegetable oil, there's a lot of neat stuff up there, but, but we, people have got to learn to open their minds and realize that we don't have to keep doing things the way that we've been doing. All right, uh, go ahead and open it up for questions uh, and a little discussion here. Great stuff. Uh, I've got actually a lot of questions, but I think I'll only ask. <laughs> I think I'll only ask one, um, especially considering the second one I forgot. So the first one would be, and it's the only one I'll ask. Um, basically, you mentioned that your big Ford excursion is more clean than the Toyota hybrid. Basically, yeah. how, how is that? Can you talk a little bit about the the sure. emissions? Sure. Thanks. Well. To start with, we don't have to be a chemist to realize that when you have a food product that's, you know, liquid sunshine basically that hasn't been chemically modified, that there's not uh, there's not a lot of nasty stuff like in petroleum. For example, sulfur dioxide is totally limited. There is no eliminated. There is no sulfur in vegetable oil, and so sulfur dioxide, which is a leading contributor to acid rain, it's gone. It's not even an issue. It's a CO2 neutral fuel. Uh, when that crop of soybeans or sunflowers or whatever is sitting there growing, it's consuming CO2. Now when we burn it, it does give off some CO2, but it gives off, off less CO2 than was consumed when the, uh, when the crop was grown. And so, you know, the problem we have with CO2 right now, it's not that CO2 is bad, you know, it's what plants thrive on and stuff like that. It's that we're dredging up CO2 from millions of years ago and we're putting that into the atmosphere along with all the stuff that's growing on the Earth's uh, surface right now. And so this fuel is, is CO2 neutral and uh, it's oxygen rich fuel. Uh, O2 will go up with your emissions, and your particulate will go down, the opacity test. And so there's been several, uh, several emissions tests. One was done uh, at an EPA lab in Colorado, I think, and across the board, uh, straight vegetable oil uh, beat out petroleum diesel and biodiesel. Biodiesel is a lot cleaner uh, on most cases. NOx does go up with biodiesel over diesel, whereas with straight vegetable oil, it goes down. So, so across the board, it's just a lot cleaner. There's less particulates, and you know, it's it's food. There's just a lot less uh, nasty stuff coming out of your tailpipe. Got another question here. Um, I was wondering if you. Uh felt that the uh, dual tank system is necessary in warmer climates uh, in light of the greater complexity versus a single tank system? Okay. Let me give a little background on his question here. Uh, uh, he asked about a two tank system versus a single tank system. Now, when I described uh, how we work with straight vegetable oil, you have your, your uh, petroleum side and you have your, your vegetable oil side and you switch between the two. Uh, there is something out there that they, is referred to as a one tank system, which is basically uh, you don't have uh, dual fuel systems, you've only got one fuel system and you can put either diesel in it or you can put just vegetable oil in it and you start it up on the vegetable oil and you, and you can run it all the time on vegetable oil. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with a dual fuel or with a single tank system, like you're referring to that, your narrow of operation, your window of, of usability is, is, is uh, narrowed down quite a bit. And the, the main thing is, is that uh, once that engine's up to temperature, the oil is, is being heated enough just by the, the heat properties of the engine. The engine acts as a final heat exchanger to heat it up enough to have proper spray pattern and everything like that. But getting it from, from the rear tank up to the engine compartment, if you're running it at uh, 20 degrees, that can be a serious problem unless you have a heated tank and heated fuel lines and heated fuel filter. And so for so, and and then of course there's certain uh, uh, engine families that don't uh, take well to single tanks. So to answer your question a little more directly, in certain situations, 
a single tank, and with certain engines, a single tank can be a viable situation. Uh, sometimes they're more complex, sometimes they're not. You know, there's a lot of ins and outs and different ways you can do things. And so if you are in a warm climate, uh, have very good oil quality and the right engine, then a single tank could be for you. But if you plan to travel very much and want to use vegetable oil in any climate, then that just narrows your window of operation down uh, considerably. And if you clog a filter or get a, a french fry stuck in your filter or something because you didn't pre-filter well, you could be sitting beside the road and you don't have an auxiliary system to switch over to. And so uh, you got to be on your toes a little bit more and you've got to really concentrate on where you're going to be and, and the vehicle that you have. So, so just a quick follow-up. Uh, I'm running a single tank in a 300D Great. in San Diego. Yeah. With no problems, but would you say the Mercedes engine is more well suited to that? Exactly. Uh, the older Mercedes that you'll find uh, driving around a lot are, are pretty much bulletproof. Uh, you know, there's kind of a, a, mis, uh, a misquote out there that, that Rudolf Diesel designed the diesel engine to run on peanut oil. And the reality is he didn't design it to run on peanut oil. He designed the engine and experimented with, with uh, many different fuels. Coal dust was one of them that just about blew his head off. And so he says, you know, there's got to be a, a different fuel that I can use that's not so volatile. And uh, the inventor of the diesel engine over 100 years ago was using peanut oil, straight vegetable oil, to, uh, to run his engine with. And so uh, there's a, actually, you know, the history of using straight vegetable oil is kind of the original, you know, biofuel it's a very long history and uh, the Mercedes engine is is built and overbuilt and over engineered and it's just a really fine piece of equipment and it does have the capability to handle a single tank system uh, a lot better than a lot of the uh, newer vehicles so the issue here seems to come down to the co2 emissions uh, I mean we have plenty of uh, carbohydrates uh, we can uh, convert into liquid fuels if we want, but uh, you know, we don't have a good way of uh, dealing with the CO2 emissions. Uh, we have, you know, if we wanted to convert to coal into gasoline, we could do it for you know, hundreds of years. There are even bigger sources. Uh, now for the Achilles heel of uh, the solutions you presented was that they you know, other than recycling waste, they all seem to generate more CO2 than the status quo, which is burning gasoline. Like the, there's a devastating study, or a couple of studies which were published in Science magazine uh, this week, which show that uh, pretty much all uh, uses of ethanol and biodiesels generate far more CO2 than uh, they save. Uh, so what is, what can we do? Yeah. Well, I, education is the biggest thing because you're correct. You know, when you look at the life cycle of, of corn-based ethanol, it's a disaster. We are not gaining. We're definitely going behind. Uh, no, you know, it's, corn base, no, it's, it's not correct that corn-based ethanol takes three gallons of fuel to generate one gallon, gallon of ethanol. It's actually slightly energy positive, but the CO2 impact is uh, worse well, than gasoline. Well, it depends on who you talk to. I've, I've yes. talked to professors at Cornell that have done some extensive research that have, have stated that. And, and here's another thing. You can find a study to base anything that you want to, you know, to, to prove any point that you want to. And so, you know, it, it's, it's kind of pointless to, to, you know, say, well, this science said this and this science said that. We've got, you know, there, there are so, some... So the, there is no scientific truth, in, in other words? <laughs> well, no, there is, but you got to wade through a lot of BS to get to it sometimes. Yes. Yeah. The, and, and so what can we do? I mean, the first thing that we've got to do when we're looking at this is conservation. And, and that's something that, that no matter what you're driving uh, or what fuel you're using, that needs to be the first tool we take out of our, our, our toolbox is, is how can I conserve. And then you've got to look at things. You know, with, with straight vegetable oil where you're using the waste product, you know, that's kind of a no-brainer because that's already there. We're trying to recycle something. But as far as when we turn that, you know, go over that hill and now we're, we're uh, growing oil-based uh, crops and everything like that, uh, to harvest as fuel, these are things that we have to look at. So I don't. All, all of those things have negative, uh, worsened the CO2 impact for hundreds of years due to land use changes. 
Yeah, well, you know, and, and there, there's going to be different camps. And, and, you know, I don't have every single answer to every, every single fuel. Kind of my overall theme is that we definitely uh, can't take things at face value, and we do need to dig a little bit deeper. So, you know, the more, the more reports you read and the more notes you make on this stuff and compare, uh, you know, we might find that, that uh, right now ethanol looks bad and biodiesel looks okay, but in the, in the future things might swap a little bit. And so we, we've got to be vigilant and make sure that we don't uh, just take things at full face value and that we do a little bit of, of digging on our own. Because if you just listen to people and don't do a little backup research, you can find somebody to support whatever uh, idea they want to come with. So we got another gentleman here that has a question. Thank you. Hi. It, uh, it seems like the, the big problem with SVO is inconvenience, an inconvenience from both your vehicle you know, supporting it as well as uh, the distribution means. And it seems like, you know, both of those are probably addressable. I'm just sort of curious, like, you know, is there any push or lobbying to get either both, you know, traditional petroleum distribution companies to help distribute SVO um, or even someone like, you know, fast food chains to have a place sure. where you can pull up and, and pump up. And then part two is um, with respect to uh, automobile manufacturers, you know, is there a push or any incentive or, or, or way to get people to make vehicles that are either dual tank or more amenable to you yeah. know, single tank with heated and all that yeah, stuff? Yeah, very good questions. Uh, first part of your question, uh, you know, Five years ago, we were just a bunch of kooks in our garage, and I mean, we still kind of are, but we've uh, been able to take this to a, a, a few levels that uh, are, are, you know, have a lot of hope. For example, we, we uh, have a, a branch office in uh, Hokkaido, Japan, and uh, we were able to do some work and get a, f a blanket exemption from the Japanese government for straight vegetable oil. And a lot of the, uh, the work that we do over there is for city governments who are in charge of the, the waste collection and disposal. And so there's a, a uh, pretty good network of, of towns and cities over there where they have centralized uh, uh, dump points for the restaurants. And those then, in turn, are used uh, in the city vehicles. In the United States here, uh, there's several companies that are starting to spring up that are processing anywhere from 15 to 20,000 gallons a month and starting to d deliver to some of our fleet customers. And uh, it's, it's slowly but surely going out of the, the single end user and uh, going up into a little bit of, of industry. And so these are natural progressions and steps as we've got a few years behind our belt and everything and people uh, that are running businesses see the, the tremendous cost uh, savings that they can do by running straight vegetable oil. Then they say, but we can't go to you know, our local fish fry house and, and get all, you know, we're in the trucking business, we can't do that. And so there are some companies that are, are popping up that are, are starting to fill that need. Uh, we actually worked on a project down in Phoenix, Arizona, all the uh, Carl's Jr. restaurants there, uh, we did a pretty extensive fleet for them and they set up fueling stations at their restaurants and so all the executives for Carl's Jr. in, in the state of Arizona run around on their own uh, french fry grease. So uh, little by little these, uh, these things are being addressed and there's companies that are seeing that need and filling that void and uh, we're working on a couple of, of uh, big projects that if I told you about it I'd have to kill you but uh, there, there are uh, moves in that direction to take this into uh, trucking companies and everything like that and get uh, collection on a grand scale so that uh, we can really make a, a big dent where it, where it matters. And uh, see your second question was, oh, car manufacturers. We actually uh, got in uh, two years ago with General Motors and, and was on a cro we were on a cross country promotional tour called the Go Green Tour. I don't think uh, when they signed us up, they really realized the ramifications of what, of how abstract straight vegetable oil is. But they were they were pretty accommodating, and uh, it was kind of cute, and it made for some good PR for them for a little bit. But I really don't see uh, a, a push right now for any car manufacturers getting on board. Unfortunately, they're a little bit tied too close to the petroleum companies, and so you know they'll they'll kind of treat it as a cute little thing as long as they don't see any threat from it. Um, hi, um, thank you for being the maverick you are. Thank you. Um, 
It would, in terms of heavy equipment, uh, say uh, buses, um, and they're driven by diesel fuel, and um, this alternative fuels that you talk about, uh, how, how well do they function in terms of re reliability, in terms of noise, and um, also um, mileage? And that would be for heavy equipment, say uh, sure. Caterpillar, or Tractor, or Detroit Diesel. Or Excellent, yeah. One of the, the great things about straight vegetable oil is, although it contains a few less BTUs than petroleum diesel, because of the added lubricity and its burn characteristics, we actually tend to notice slight gains in horsepower and fuel economy. So there's not, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, with ethanol, you've got to, you take a pretty big uh, hit in efficiency, but with, with the vegetable oil, because of its density and its lubricity, uh, it gives you just as much uh, bang for your buck as diesel does, if not just a little bit more. And uh, the, the added benefit is because it lubricates well, the longevity of your engine is going to, uh, you know, I don't go around saying, hey, your engine's gonna last forever if you, you know, run on vegetable oil, but, but done right, uh, and when I say done right, meaning that you have clean, dry fuel, uh, the longevity of your engine is not going to, uh, to go down at all. And in some cases, we've seen with older vehicles, they've actually held on for a little bit longer because of the, the added lubrication. And uh, so we've, we've done a lot of applications with big rigs. Uh, I guess I can go. I've got a few more slides here we'll, we'll go through. Here's some of the vehicles we've done, big semi-trucks, uh, my bus, some motor homes. Uh, that right there was the truck that we did for the Gen General Motors tour. And, uh, you know, the, big, the bigger they are, uh, the better they like it and the quicker your payback. Some of the, uh, the big fleets that we do, we've got guys that are going through, you know, just unbelievable amounts of fuel and they actually can uh, make their money back in a matter of a month or two. And uh, instead of, you know, for some end users, it may take them a year to make their initial investment back. So, you had a question, sir. Yeah, you mentioned uh, three billion gallons a year, I believe, is the waste oil. Well, th approximately. That's a hard number to pin down. Mm -hmm. I've heard th some of the the general numbers, and, and somebody's going to Google this and then tell me <laughs> I'm wrong. But uh, here, that's good. Just send me an email so I have the exact number. But the numbers that I've I've looked at for over the last year or two, there's somewhere between five to six billion gallons produced in the U.S. annually, and it's roughly estimated that about half of that is not made, doesn't make it into any recycled uh, uh, system at this point. And well, some of it's in the food itself, right? You eat french fries there. Some of it's in so the food. Cool. Well, when I say <laughs> a lot of it, uh, the, the stuff that is collected uh, is put in uh, animal foods and uh, is put in cosmetics and stuff. And then a lot of the smaller places are just dumping it in the back 40. And So my question was, <laughs> what's our um, daily usage of petroleum? For transportation, it's on the order of hundreds Don't ask of millions. Me hard of? numbers like no. Well. Uh, I've just shooting from the hip. I think that that represents less than one percent of our diesel uh, consumption. Oh, just the diesel. Itself. Yeah, just the diesel consumption. So it's not a huge number, but when we look at uh, technologies like algae oil and the, the huge numbers that they can bring in per acre, and you don't need you know arable land, you can do it in the desert with seawater. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Calif Southern California that could fit that bill, you know. And uh, so there is some huge potential for growth there. But uh, as far as just the waste vegetable oil, you know, I, you're talking maybe around 1%, a little less. So that's, uh, that would still be a very large fleet, 1% of the U.S. Oh, well, several, yeah, I mean, that... So you it, got a big, it's you got a a big start. expansion, yeah, it's, right, but yeah, you're not going to replace all gasoline. Not going to replace right. all diesel fuel at this point, uh, but, you know, it's, it's definitely some, some, uh, a place to start. So, any other questions? Yes. There is any difference in the vegetable oil that you use? I mean, my question is connected to the fact that uh, you were talking about the farmer and ethanol. I mean, they can still use... Uh, we can still use the corn that they produce to create vegetable oil. Yeah, yeah it doesn't matter what pl plant the oil is. Well, let me back up. There's there's one or two uh, plant oils that don't do too good in this. Uh, one of them is linseed oil. If that sounds familiar, it's because they use it in paint. 
and it dries like that. It's got a really, it, it, it'll polymerize very quickly. That's not one you want to use, but nobody cooks with linseed oil, so it's not really a problem. But as far as the common oils that are used to cook with peanut oil, olive oil, canola, whatever, it all burns good and you can all mix it together and make, you know, pretty, pretty healthy concoction there. So, yes, sir. So you said today that people have to pay to have the vegetable oil removed as waste in many instances? In, in, in most places, yeah. There's a few markets around the country where the, the rendering companies will actually pay the restaurant, you know, a few pennies per gallon. But, and then there's places where they don't pay them, but they don't charge. But more often than not, the restaurants have to pay to dispose of it. It seems like if there was usable energy in it or, you know, a reasonable amount that was you know, easily converted by you know, normal processes, that there would be, you know, people who would be burning it in, you know, larger reactors to, off, you know, to do cogeneration and, you know, plants and stuff, and that this would quickly become a valued commodity, right? It's like, if people well, were dumping gasoline Well, we're gasoline working as hard as we fingers. can. <laughs> but, you know, and, and this is the thing. I mean, to a lot of people that first learn about this, this straight vegetable and stuff, they're like, wow, this really makes sense. How come everybody's not doing this? How come other people aren't doing it? And, you know, unfortunately, Sometimes really good ideas take a little while to catch on. I mean, there is a huge groundswell of interest and, and, and growth in, in our industry and everything, but, but uh, and people are like, you know, what's the catch, you know? But really, there's literally millions and millions of gallons sitting out behind restaurants and, and getting dumped in the landfill and everything of a perfectly, you know, liquid burnable fuel that can be used in, in existing equipment and we don't really have to wait for new technology. So, you know, sometimes it's frustrating because you, you, you're like, you know, how come people can't see that, you know, even though it's a, it's a small percentage, it's a percentage and we could be doing something with this. And, and my message is, is that if there's something this obvious that we deal with every day, everybody's eating fried food every day, if there's something this obvious, what else are we missing? Let's open our eyes and realize that, you know, there's all kinds of stuff we're throwing out that we might be using for energy. So. Do you know if anybody uses it for cogeneration today? Oh, yeah. You mean like electrical generation? Yeah, run it in a big diesel engine, connect to your plant, and you'd probably save, you know, potentially save a ridiculous amount of money. Yeah, I've got, I've got uh, a lot of customers that uh, run generators with this if they're off the grid and stuff. Uh, you know, generally speaking, net metering states, you're not going to make enough money to offset your cost, but if you're in a situation where you want to produce your own electricity, it's extremely cost effective. So, um, I just wanted to speak to your points about, you know, the costs of uh, reticulating electricity around as an argument against uh, electric vehicles, because I think the system that you're describing with SVO is, you know, something that could work with, uh, you know, ele electrical propulsion, sure. like, you know, in a hybrid setup. So they don't necessarily have to be opposed. But I, I, I just wanted to clarify that that um, that issue because it's an argument that's been brought up. I remember reading the there's a book called Plug-in Hybrids, and it sort of sprung board off of the um, Who Killed the Electric Car thing. There was a whole conspiracy yeah. theory around that. Um, I guess the thing is that yes, there are lots of coal plants producing electricity, um, but there's also a number of uh, hydro plants around in the states. So. It's one of those things where if it suits locally uh, for you to run an electric vehicle, then, you know, the economies might be right. For example, you here bet. we've got a bunch of solar cells on those carports yeah. and electric leads hanging down and no one's using them. Yeah, and I didn't so. want to give the impression that I'm against electric cars because she, she you know, she, she reiterates my point very well that you just need to look and, and see what your situation is. And, and sometimes... Even though we may not be quite there yet, you got the chicken and the egg scenario. We don't have the renewable electricity quite yet, but we've got to develop the, the electric cars and get those more accepted before we can, you know, get the, the renewable energy. And so I'm not opposed to, to technology just because at this point in time they're, they're, they haven't quite made it over the hill. And, uh, but I think it's very important to be informed of exactly where it's coming from so that we at least know what the rules to the game are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. one of the other economies with electric propulsion is you've got all the fancy regenerative braking and yeah. all, all of that cool stuff. So yeah, there, there's there's some amazing technologies out there, and and 
I, you know, I, I just look at the, the SVO stuff, and if, if we had the diesel hybrids in the states, how, you know, we could marry those two up together and, and we could really be getting somewhere then. And so, you know, I think all these things are important to, to not discount any one of them right off the bat, but let's make sure that we, we uh, really analyze where they're coming from and, and know what the rules to the game are so that if, it, if they're not quite there, we know which direction we need to head. I think we're uh, officially out of time, but uh, I'll be happy to stick around and talk to anybody if uh, you got any more questions. Thank you for coming.